I have been involved in culture throughout my entire life. The mission of Collage is to serve the community, to bring programming to the community, and to involve the community. So it gives people a reason to show up. This is the kind of thing that I just see as being tremendously important. I've been very proud of some of the events that we've done that have just exceeded my expectations because people went so deep into such emotional topics about literally the meaning of life, what it's like to move between communities, keeping art and music, coming to people of all ages. It's what makes this all worth it. We like programs for people who enjoy recreational thinking just for fun. I could just go on about this. We're doing something that I hope will keep on going long after I'm gone. Welcome to Angel City Culture Quest, where art, social justice, and the environment meet in Los Angeles. I am your host, Melina Paris, and I welcome you to this episode. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Angel City Culture Quest. Today, we have Richard Foss with us, the executive director of Collage, a place for art and culture. And we'll be discussing how Collage is amplifying the social capital of San Pedro. Hello, Richard. How are you today? Alive and well, thank you. Had a great show last night and looking forward to another good event today. Yeah, it's an art show today, isn't it? Yes, it's an artist who takes shredded old tires and turns into works of art with bizarre coloring and coating. And that's just an interesting medium, very unusual. And his show will be up through the rest of the month. So if people hear something about this that interests them, they can come by. Yeah, that sounds great. What is the artist's name? Uh, Nate Jones the Younger. I gather that there's someone else named Nate Jones and <laughs> someone else named Nate Jones Jr. So he has to segregate himself as Nate Jones the Younger. <laughs> that's good. I like that. Well, let's go into a little bit of information about you today. Yeah. Richard is, as I said, the executive director of Collage, which he founded with George Wytovich, who is the creative director, and Patty Krakovic, who is involved in the strategic planning. Richard is also a journalist, science fiction author, and culinary historian who has also chaired science fiction conventions, worked as a travel agent, restaurant reviewer, theater director, and instructor in Elizabethan history and culinary history at Osher Institute at UCLA Extension. Richard has written for newspapers and magazines for more than 30 years. His reviews have appeared in The Easy Reader, Peninsula Magazine, LA City Beat, LA Valley Beat Magazine, and Random Lengths News. Richard has also written two books, Rum, A Global History, and Food in the Air and Space, The Surprising History of Food and Drink in the Skies. He currently serves on the board of the Culinary Historians of Southern California. That's a lot, Richard. <laughs> You're a busy guy. It's very I, interesting. I have just been involved in culture in one way or another throughout my entire life. In my bio, the thing that stands out is the part of running the travel agency. Yeah. And that seems a little bit outside the other things. But if you know that when I had the travel agency, I spent a lot of my time running art and culture tours. Well, it all of a sudden fits in with everything else. It all comes together. That's great. So can you please explain to folks, what is the mission of Collage? Well, in our mission statement, it begins, the mission of Collage is to serve both the local and broader community with programs that are adventurous yet accessible. And it goes on to talk about what our definition of culture is and the breadth of that, whether it means traditional culture, cultures that you feel that you willingly become part of or deliberately become part of, that there are all kinds of different meanings for culture there are all kinds of meaning for art. But really, it is both those things where part of our mission is to bring this type of programming to the community. And another part is to involve the community in art. We have free art shows. We have free events at which we have jam sessions of different types, where the idea is to involve the community and create a theatrical and musical community here in San Pedro that doesn't currently exist. 
there isn't another place where people can go for free to just play their instruments, meet other people. And in the mm. process of meeting those people, maybe form bands or maybe not form bands, maybe just play for your own enjoyment and have a great time and be social. So we are trying to foster something in the local community that just isn't there while also appealing to a broader community to give people a reason to come to San Pedro because something is happening here that isn't happening anywhere else. We had a program of modern Portuguese photo music. I can guarantee that nowhere else in 50 miles were people listening to modern Portuguese photo music and there were people who drove from the valley, from inland LA to nice. hear this. So it gives people a reason to show up. Yeah. And Collage is also a registered 501c3 nonprofit organization, which is dedicated to helping the next generation of musicians fulfill their aspirations. Can you please elaborate on how Collage does this? One of the principal things is very personal, uh, and it's based on something that happened in my life and my perception of a need which is one of my kids was having a real tough time in high school with a group of people around her who I will just say they were not supportive. They were kind of emotional vampires. And mm -hmm. I saw how being part of high school band helped them straighten out their life, helped them find a group of people where they had this collaboration, where they were working together to make music and art. And those achievements created stability in my kid's life. But I also saw something else, which was that there was someone who was in that band who was over at my house for jam sessions, because I used to run jam sessions at my house where all the kids can come and play. And I would invite some professional and quality musicians to come and join in with them. So we had this great multi-generational music thing happening. And there was this kid by the name of Carrie who showed up at these who loved music, adored it. Well, on high school graduation, he lost the group of people he'd been playing with. He lost the place he'd been playing, and he lived in a house with lots of other people. And let me tell you, if you like to practice your trumpet or drums when you've got a bunch of roommates, that's not the path to great popularity. I'll just put it that way. And a couple years out of school, that kid committed suicide. And if that kid had continued to have music in his life, he'd be around today because he lived for music. And he had lost the place that he played, the people he played with, and the school has said, give your instrument back. Mm. So one of the things that I have wanted to do for years after observing that, after observing how my kid, who incidentally is now working at a school and among other things, teaching kids things having to do with music, I have seen how music has helped someone flourish and the lack of it has literally caused someone to decide that there wasn't a reason to live. So as a start, we started collecting musical instruments, having them professionally refurbished, and giving them to graduating seniors at San Pedro High so that those kids would own their own instrument. No one would ever be able to take it away from them. It's theirs. And then besides that, not just giving them an instrument to play, but giving them a place to play it by opening up for jam sessions on a monthly basis. And then also helping to foster that community. The most recent jazz jam that we had the age range was from 14 years old to 85. Oh, God. So there were right. people all different ages who were playing together. And the presence of those young people causes the older people to really be invigorated. They start mentoring the young folks. And the presence of the young folks, they're playing along with people who have probably greater skills and greater experience. And they learn. And this is the kind of thing that I just see as being tremendously important. So that is one of the major things that we do. And I've mentioned that's where it started. We want to expand this. I've also contacted the Longshore unions and their pensioners and said, look, there are probably people who quit a job that they've had for 40, 50 years, and then suddenly discover that their life was their job. Maybe they used to play music. Would they like to have instruments? Would they like to join in? I've contacted also a group that works with previously incarcerated people. They need to find a way to build a bridge to a new community. When you're at a jam session, nobody cares where you spent the last couple of years. They care, hey, can you pick up this solo? Are you playing in time? And that gives them an avenue into a new, healthier community. So that started with San Pedro high school students. And if you look at our website, you'll see pictures where we've given instruments to them. But it's gone beyond that. I have a violin that is going to someone who lives in Culver City. 
single mom with a kid who wants to play the violin, we're giving that kid the violin. It starts in one city, but it's not about just helping people in this one city. It's not about helping just one age range. It's about helping anyone who wants to have music in their life. And we're looking for other ways of expanding these programs beyond music. We'd like to be able to have people to mentor young writers and work with them because maybe they have teachers who actually have the time to spend time with them in school. Most of them don't. Mm -hmm. But there is part of the year where you're out of school. And for kids who are out of school, here's a place where somebody might want to listen to your poetry. So we're always open to ways of expanding what we do to serve a broader community so that we can give them a way to have some type of art in their life, some type of expression. That's wonderful. And the connections that you mentioned with the older people and the high school students, that's amazing. There's so much there. A lot of people who are very lonely, their kids have left home, maybe live yeah. a long way away. They have no youth and energy and vigor in their lives. They spend all their time with people the same age. And when they get around the younger people, wow, you see them brighten up. Yeah. I wanted to mention, I think it came as a result of the pandemic or maybe right before that, but there's a Department of Aging. So check into that. Yes. I just wanted to throw that out there for you. <laughs> but we have a testimonial from one of the San Pedro High School students, Grant Granucci. Yes. He said, the program was such a great opportunity. Every day, I'm thankful for Mr. Foss's efforts to encourage musical growth in the youth of San Pedro. And I hope that the children of tomorrow can have the same opportunity I had. I love that he said that. He's an absolute monster on a drum kit who keeps time like an atomic clock and can really yeah. do some soloing too. Wow. Great. Go Grant. <laughs> We love hearing that kind of feedback. We love working with people. One of the things we've been doing is we've been inviting some of the people we've given instruments to. We've given some guitars to people. I'll send something out to some of the students who receive guitars saying, come to tonight's show for free because, oh. you know, you play guitar. You might want to hear this guitarist. Yeah. So yeah. We want to help them not just with the instrument, but with having models in terms of their playing to open them up to things other than the pop music or whatever it is that they've been playing. Maybe if they hear flamenco, they might want to add a little bit of that into their playing. And we've had flamenco players. We've had some people that did remarkable things with looping their guitars. So we're continuing their education in our own way. Yeah, definitely. Now, let's talk a little bit about collage itself. Collage opened in 2020 and then almost closed immediately because the first show was two days before the pandemic shut everything down. Two days before the pandemic. I had yeah. been working on setting up this show for something like eight months. I had a whole lineup of shows that were scheduled because we were going to open up strong with all of these performers. And then we had one show, which was with a banjo player and guitarist out of North Carolina named Eugene Chadbourne, who is famous in avant-garde circles because he takes Appalachian music and jazz and various other things and throws them together into something indescribable. And he was playing with a bassist named Victor Krummenacher, who formed a group called Camper Van Beethoven a number of years ago. They had a couple of hits. Mm. And when you look and you see a banjo player and an upright bass, you figure you're going to have an evening of bluegrass and old time stuff. And they were playing Alice Coltrane ragas and weird free jazz and oh. also Appalachian music and also kind of pop numbers. And they had this great show. Everybody loved it. But you could already see the writing on the wall. Other venues were already closing. Other venues were already cutting back. And then two days later, the county and the state just said, hey, close everything. So we had to close down for a year and a half. And we reopened in July of 2021. Right. So that was a real setback. Yeah. But in one way, you were able to regroup because you started streaming shows through the pandemic. We started working on live streaming because during that pandemic, we had no idea whether performances were going to come back. Was this yeah. going to take months or years? And we were thinking about how can we both serve the community because 
there are community meetings that are not happening because people can't use public spaces. So we were looking at ways of doing this and we just killed our budget buying enough equipment that we could do live streaming with four cameras so that we could have a panel discussion or a community meeting. And at just about the point that we got the whole thing set up, well, things started to open again. (laughs) So you don't know what your schedule is yeah. going to be. We have live streamed programs since then. It hasn't been a situation where it's live streaming or nothing as we had feared. Yeah. So it's live streaming in addition to the other things that we've done. So it has made it possible for us to do some programs that would not have been viable otherwise. We've had some programs where we've had four times as many people live streaming as we've had in the audience. And it made it so that we could do a program with a professor of philosophy talking about philosophy in everyday life. And there were people tuning in from all over California because they were familiar with this professor and with his ideas and wanted to see it. So we had a live audience and having that dimension made it so that the live audience acted as intellectual stand-ins for all of the people out there who couldn't be asking their questions. After he gave his talk, there was another over an hour at which the audience was giving questions and it made it human. It made it feel like you weren't just watching TV, you were watching something where in real time, people were asking important questions about literally the meaning of life of an eclectic, funny professor, and it was happening in real time. So we've had programs like that, where the live streaming has been a great addition to the experience for the live audience. That's wonderful. And especially through that time, to have that particular discussion on philosophy. We have a regular who tunes into our live streams who lives in a small town called Sant'Alessio in Sicily. And there's no bluegrass scene in a small town in Sicily. So if he wants live (laughs) bluegrass shows, he's watching them at breakfast when we're broadcasting them in the evening. So That's great. I love it. So since the pandemic, you had more than 200 events at Collage. And Collage, I want to say, is a beautiful venue. It was built in the 1930s, featuring Art Deco styling, both original and recreated by George Wytovich. It's an intimate and relaxed venue, seating 49. And the inside is more modern and visually interesting, thanks to aged brick walls and a curved wood ceiling with open beams. It's really very pleasant in there. And by a wonderful accident, that curved wood ceiling helps our acoustics immeasurably. This space, when I first looked at it with the brick walls, and I was thinking, oh man, this is going to be an echo chamber. And then it wasn't. Instead, it has just crystal clear sound. One of our early shows, we had a guitarist, and we had everything set up with microphones and all, and he said, oh, I'm working without it. And it's like, you're playing for an audience of about 50 people in a big room. And he said, watch me. And He was playing the guitar, and this was something where there were three guitarists on this particular show, and two of them were playing amplified. And then he starts playing, and he's not only playing one acoustic guitar in a big room, he's playing it softly. But everyone in the audience is leaning forward and listening intently. And I realized he's on to something. Everybody is listening intently for every single note. They are focusing so tightly on what he's doing and appreciating so much what he's doing in a way that they enjoyed and they focused in on the other people. But the natural sound of the guitar in that room was just fantastic. And I looked later at the business card this guitarist had given me and it said on his business card, can't play fast, won't play loud. And it's like, (laughs) that's funny to see on a professional musician. I know. Yeah, he has a bunch of albums out. And so evidently can't play fast and won't play loud is a success strategy for that guy. (laughs) And he was at the right venue. Hello, everybody. If you're just tuning in today, our guest is Richard Foss, the executive director of Collage, a place for art and culture. Thank you. folks, this is your host, Melina Paris. Angel City Culture Quest is growing. We're barely into our third year now, and there's so much more quest-worthy inspiration to bring you. Art, books, film, coverage of local events, and more. We've gotten a new QR code, 
so you can capture episodes on the go because I know you're busy. We've been creating artistic flyers unique to each episode and new Angel City Culture Quest stickers. And there's more to come. As you know, there are costs to keep this podcast going. So if you're able, join me in this quest with your support. Think of it as a cultural tip jar to share any amount that you're comfortable with. Even a few dollars a month will contribute to my ability to continue bringing you the great work of these artists, activists, and others, and the cultural content that you want to hear about. I would be honored to have your support. To donate, please go to my Patreon link at patreon.com forward slash Angel City Culture Quest. There you can also see all of our past episodes. Thank you. Now, I'd like to talk about why did you choose to become a nonprofit opposed to simply a venue? It would have been fantastically easier to just be a venue because if we were just a venue run for a private purpose, we wouldn't have to have a whole bunch of reporting to the state. We wouldn't have to have a whole bunch of keeping minutes of our board of directors and everything else. It would have been easier. But for one thing, we're doing something that I hope will keep on going long after I'm gone. And the way to do that is to have the involvement of a board of directors, it's to have the board of advisors, it's to have all of these people who are connecting with the community who are ready to step in. Because I believe that the things we're doing, keeping art and music, coming to people of all ages, keeping them involved, a nonprofit is the structure for doing that kind of thing, not a for-profit. So that was the thing to do. And if we had become just a for-profit venue, I mean, for-profit venues, when you're trying to at least break even on running shows, you don't need to have something where, okay, that sousaphone needs $200 worth of repairs. You don't need to have that situation where, okay, I've got three trombones and people who want them, but they don't have cases. I've got to buy cases. The charitable aspect uh, saps us of money, takes energy, but it's part of what makes this all worth it. So nonprofit is the right structure for what we do. And this is not my first foray into nonprofits. I've been on the board of several nonprofits before and founded another nonprofit historical society. So I've done this a couple of times before, and I know what I'm getting into. This has been the most difficult, not only due to the timing, but due to the ambition of the nonprofit and due to the fact that we really are actively looking for more people to become involved in this and haven't been able to find some people to take some roles who really understand what they're doing. We're always looking for help, but it would have been easier. It wouldn't be the right way to do it. And while we're best known for concerts, we've also run art classes, art workshops, storytelling. We had a wonderful program where we had someone who has professionally told stories in Ireland. They have a very high regard for story, and it's a high bar yeah. to be a professional Irish storyteller. Oh, but yeah. this person has done that. And I put them on the same bill with an Afro-Caribbean storyteller so that each of them did their thing with telling their stories. And then it's like, okay, sit next to each other and talk about, well, what about your story would have been different if I told it? And let's talk about what story is in different cultures and the way that we teach using stories. So it's not just about the performance. It's about the performance and then also the things that give the audience insight as to the performer's mental state, as to what creativity is all about. And we've done that a number of times. And that's not a thing that you're going to see in any bar that is, you know, a bar might possibly have a storyteller. They're not going to do the analysis behind it, the meta that lets you know the important things behind the scenes. I've been very proud of some of the events that we've done that have just exceeded my expectations because people went so deep into such emotional topics and you discover things about the artists. One of the events that we had that was unpredictable and wonderful is I realized at one point that among my personal friends, I knew a Jewish cantor who had a jazz band and an Episcopal priest who have formerly had a career as an opera singer and love Broadway tunes. Wow. And I asked them to do a show together where each of them would do their act. And I said, for the finale, would you do some duets? 
Well, by the time they finished rehearsing, the whole show was duets. And the Episcopal priest was singing in Hebrew, and the Jewish cantor was demonstrating that Jews wrote all the good Christmas songs. And it was hilarious. <laughs> they were doing a yeah. mix of secular and sacred music that they could never do anywhere else. Because if you go to a jazz club and start singing sacred music, they're just going to stare at you. That's not going to go over because they're tight focus on jazz. And at church, if you start singing Broadway tunes, they'll call the people from the funny farm because you've obviously lost it. So this was a chance of exploring art and creativity and the sacred and the secular. And it was also a really fun, funny show. They yeah. did a wonderful little thing between them where they showed that there are popular tunes that you've heard all of your life, where what the composers had done is they had taken some obscure piece of sacred music, written new lyrics, and then gone and copyrighted it. So they sang things where you're thinking, I've heard that tune before. And they would sing part of it as the ancient words, the sacred words. Mm -hmm. And they would think, sing the popular song. And it was something that was really enlightening. Wow. Both and that's of those. the kind of thing that we do that you just don't see in another venue. We can do that. And I wish more people appreciated it. But it's hard to advertise something like this because it's so unlike what other people are doing that people don't understand it until they see it. Yeah, that's exactly it. But fascinating events that you're having there. And we'll get the word out. And we also have authors out there with their books. I did a panel discussion, which was partly funded by the Big Read program of the NEA uh, and the Los Angeles Department of Cultural Affairs, where I had a New York Times best-selling Mexican-American author, a award-winning science fiction author who is Chinese, and another award-winning detective author who is Japanese, and had them talking about writing multicultural and bilingual characters. And not surprisingly, there were a bunch of people who showed up in the audience who were themselves writers and were able mm -hmm. to get these insights about writing. But even if you weren't an aspiring writer, it still gives you a window into what it's like to move between communities and how you portray that. So we like programs for people who enjoy recreational thinking. It's one of the things that I used to love about science fiction conventions. It's not so much about any given book that somebody has read or any given movie that they've seen. It's that the kind of people who show up at those are whimsical, thoughtful, questioning, and they like to go into questions about art and nature and philosophy just for fun. And having the different ethnicities and talking about how they write characters of different ethnicities is fascinating. And it's another way of establishing connections, which we need more of, obviously. We all talk about that a lot. So you're offering, like you said earlier at the top of the show, culture in many different forms. The old Italian and Croatian community, the people in the Hispanic community, the African-American communities, the newcomers who are moving in are raising property values. To a certain degree, there's a camp kind of society where art is a place where they can come together. And I want to see that happen. Yeah, that's what you're giving the community here. And one of the things I wanted to talk about about San Pedro is the benefit of a location with a majority of locally owned businesses. You had touched on this in our earlier conversation. This is what San Pedro largely offers. In terms of promoting locations, we see that small owned businesses are always put forward as a positive selling point. It's in the zeitgeist. Mom and pop stores and restaurants that can cater uniquely to a variety of clients. This signifies freedom, ingenuity, and creativity. And you mentioned that you highlight this when you promote downtown San Pedro. What kinds of reactions do you observe when you mention this? Well, first of all, I have become a tireless promoter of San Pedro as an entertainment and art destination. And people in the rest of Los Angeles have no clue about this. It's not that people who live in Redondo Beach or Manhattan Beach think about coming to San Pedro for arts and entertainment and then decide not to. It's that they never think of it. They don't right. know it's there because San Pedro has not actively promoted in areas like Torrance and Carson and in the beach cities where they really, really should. I'm working on putting something together, meeting with other entertainment venue owners to see about collaborating to promote San Pedro as an arts destination. 
because there's some wonderful stuff here. The problem is when I hear somebody from Redondo Beach say, well, I don't go to San Pedro because it's too far. And I ask, oh, do you go up to Hollywood for concerts? And it's like, yeah, all the time. It's like, why don't you map this? Check this out. Why don't you do it at around rush hour and see how long it takes you to get to Hollywood versus how long it takes you to get to San Pedro? And there's this strange tendency to just think of San Pedro as being at the end of the earth in one way it is, which is that you don't go to downtown San Pedro on your way to anything else. It is at the end of the freeway. It is at the edge of something. Downtown San Pedro is off of Gaffey Street. It looks like any suburban avenue, and there is no real way that people know that just a couple of blocks away is a place that's really interesting. It's the only downtown that I know of, of its size, that has no chain restaurants, so that you really have some of the community-supported spaces. So I have to promote it to people. I have to let people know about this. And I have never actually lived within the city limits of San Pedro. I've been visiting there all my life because of the fact that my father was in the Navy, my grandfather was merchant marine, and in the days before cell phones, we were just used to all the time getting a phone call from, oh, my old shipmates in San Pedro, we're going over there. So going to the harbor area is something that I remember. I remember when the Navy ships were open so that you could take a tour through them, and my father took us over again and again to go through all of the Navy ships. My twin brother and I, and we would dress up in little sailor suits when we were kids to go and walk around the ships. So I got friendships with people in the Croatian community. I was a volunteer at the free clinic when I was in my 20s. Granted, there was a really charming, cute receptionist who was part of the reason that I was volunteering there. The relationship went nowhere, but I kept doing it. It I've been around the community, even though I never lived there. So I have seen how it has changed. But Insofar as people outside the community know San Pedro, they have an old negative impression from the days when, yeah, drunk sailors down on Beacon Street and that sort of thing. And they haven't come to see that it's different. So I need to lead with that. I need to tell people this is an area that is one of the few places where artists can still afford to live and their galleries are open. If you were hanging around downtown Los Angeles 40 years ago, it was like that. It was a place where you could get a big warehousey space because nobody wanted to live in downtown LA. Look at what downtown LA so-called arts district is like now. Artists can't afford to move in there. So San Pedro is still one of the last areas somewhere near the coast with freeway access that has not gentrified to the point where artists can't live there. And yes, it probably will. Almost no doubt that it will. But for now, it still is this oasis that has its own character that is not homogenized. And I try to sell that character. By the way, here's my list of my favorite restaurants in the area. And here's a list of some of the other galleries. And I promote to people, yes, come down. If we're open on first Thursday, come and see us. But also go and see these other places. So I'm promoting our place while also promoting San Pedro. That's great. And it is a charming place. And you're right. Driving down Gaffey, you'd have no idea about downtown, which is literally two blocks away. Yeah. It is just amazing how much is needed to let people know that that downtown is there. And the problem is it's really not very easy to get that across to people. How do you tell people to drive down a couple of blocks and you're going to see all of this nice old architecture and some funky little thrift stores and some restaurants with character? (laughs) <laughs> yeah. That said, I miss a lot of the old restaurants that used to be around San Pedro. I remember as a kid coming to Ante's and some of the Croatian restaurants because of the fact that my grandfather was a German speaker who loved coming down. There were people who were German speakers who hung out in the Croatian restaurants and he could enjoy conversations with them. And I remember coming down, of course, to Papadakis. Because yeah. what fun, like a restaurant where people are throwing plates and there are Greek people dancing. and you know, On the that... tables, on the tables. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So yeah. that was so much fun. I, I do miss some of those. And I would love to see more restaurants that reflect that culture. I don't know if it's going to happen because... You have people who came to the United States as Italians or Croatians, and the second generation are Croatian Americans and Italian Americans, and third generation's Americans. They've dropped their heritage. And that's a common thing. In a lot of cases, the parents did not want to reinforce that. 
My mother's family was Polish and they refused to teach her a word of Polish because they said, you're in America. You won't even learn our language because I don't want you to fall back into just being part of the Polish community rather than the American community. I think it might have been because her parents wanted to be able to talk among themselves without the kids understanding. But still, you know, there's that tendency to lose language, to lose the sound of your ancestral music being the sound of home. And that's a shame. We're, in a way, by the fact that we're bringing Italian music, we have a, a Sicilian singer, Michaela Mussolino, who is a great interpreter of Italian music who we're bringing in. And San Pedro is trying to refashion itself as a little Italy. We're going to have Italian culture there. I've tried reaching out to various Italian associations, haven't heard back from any of them. And here I am trying to bring Italian culture to San Pedro. Hopefully you'll be pleasantly surprised. I hope so. Yeah. Uh, Speaking of shows, can you please tell us what cultural events Collage has immediately coming up? Well, we have a Tongva culture bearer named Tina Calderon, who will be singing both ancient and new songs in the Tongva language. And it's a chance to meet and hear the first people. And she'll be telling their stories so that you'll be able to hear some of the legends, which have a whimsical humor about them that's just delightful. She was there before, and it was almost a sold-out show. And I'm sure that that's going to work well again. And it'll be a chance to hear a Native voice telling the stories of her people, and you will feel a new connection to the land and to those people by just experiencing that. Mm -hmm. Uh, Then on October 14th, we have Eric Rigler, who is an Irish piper and whistle player who was heard in the Titanic movie and in a whole bunch of other famous movies. He's a virtuoso player, and he's going to be playing with a composer and violinist named Lily Honigberg. And it's going to be Celtic folk and just all kinds of music, eclectic Celtic music. I'm looking forward to that. We have a benefit show that we're doing for Maui Disaster Relief. 100% of the proceeds will go to relief. And that's called Postcards from Home. And it's a Hawaiian storyteller, a slack key guitar player, and a hula dancer. Where else is that kind of thing going to happen? All kinds of different programs that we're bringing to this area that we hope the local and the broader community will partake. Because what does community mean? Where you know, where do you draw the boundaries? Because we have people who are coming from Orange County from Long Beach. We've had somebody who has driven in several times from Victorville because of the fact that there was nothing between here and Victorville that was exactly the kind of show he wanted to see. So we get people coming in from quite a distance. That's great. When is that Maui show? The Maui show, Postcards from Home, that's on October 28th, featuring storyteller Kamaka Brown, singer-songwriter Kimo Williams. October 28th. Great. We'll look forward to that one. That's important. Then we have a lot of jazz shows. There are some of the people who have shown up at our jam sessions, which are the third Wednesday of every month, and they're some of the Long Beach State students, and we're delighted to have them coming over and bringing new bands. So it's a case of, you want to hear some of these people first? You want to hear people who are really excited about jazz and are doing original work? This is the place to come. Into the new year, we have some shows that are sponsored by a group called Bright Work New Music, which focuses on living composers. And they're bringing some of their shows so that you can hear new music by modern classical composers. So we're going in all kinds of directions. We have singer-songwriters, and we're bringing in more of the authors and poets, too. I could just go on about this, but... (laughs) You probably, I would try people's patience. (laughs) (laughs) I'm enthusiastic about all of this. I love it. Yeah, it sounds wonderful. It's eclectic and it's a little bit of something for everyone. Yeah. So Richard, can you please tell us where can we find you and Collage? Well, you can find out what we're doing next online at our website, collageartculture.org. And I want to make a note, which is if we had thought about this for one minute, we would have first of all given it a different name because people keep saying college rather than collage, (laughs) not being able to find us. 
And collageartculture.org is an unwieldy website, but we've already got it, so we're using it. But we wanted to encapsulate what we were in the URL, and that was probably a mistake, but we've already done it. We're located at 731 South Pacific Avenue, which, yes, 731 is located right by 8th Street, and I don't know who did the numbering in this area, but I think some beverages were involved (laughs) because it's crazy. Right between 7th and 8th on Pacific. And I'd like to let people know collage is all caps, C-O-L-L-A-G-E. Yes. So that'll maybe help them in their search. The all caps is not really necessary. I hope they'll find us. And just to mention to your listeners, we are always looking for ideas about what we can do. This is not about my taste. It can't be about my taste. It shouldn't be about my taste in booking because we want to reflect what the community wants. And it's much easier to give the community what they want if they tell us what that is. So we encourage people If you have an idea for a type of show or performance or community event, we love involving the community. On the second Wednesday of every month, we have ukulele night, where if you play the ukulele, come on over and do it. And you don't have to be a virtuoso. You can just come and play along with simple Hawaiian songs. Or sometimes we go beyond that. They're talking about having a Beatles on ukulele night. They've had some 1920s music on ukulele. So we have our ukulele night. The third Wednesday of every month, we have the jam session that, as I said, is open to everybody. The fourth Tuesday of every month, we have a session where people come to just a cappella sing old English songs, madrigals, and it's just about the joy of harmonizing, the joy of singing harmony in secular harmony, because the only place you can usually find to do harmony singing is a church, and it's a limited material, but this is about singing all kinds of music and just the joy of blending voices. We want to add more. I'm trying to find someone who will lead a bluegrass and Americana jam. I had somebody who's ready to do it, but she got a job down in Long Beach and just made it so she can't do it right now. I'm trying to find other people who might be willing to come and have a hoot holler and pick night where you come over and play American music. I want to open as often as we can with the community making as many kinds of music as possible. So I'm always looking for help. I'm looking for people with ideas, looking for people who might be willing to help mentor students. So yeah, that was a long answer to a short question. (laughs) And the writing program too, that sounds very interesting. So you're looking for that as well. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing all about you and collage and the wonderful things and the shows going on there. It's been really enlightening. Well, thank you. And I am happy to be on your podcast here and hope to see you again at Collage soon. Oh, I'll be there for sure. Thank you, Richard. I enjoyed the discussion. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed the show, Please rate and recommend on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts.